and a good Tuesday evening to you. Uh, I'm grateful for those of you that have marked out some time uh, for us to get in on this study. This is a part 23, so I'm surely grateful for those of you that have labored with me uh, going through this series here. There's many of you live here in our session, and some of you that are watching through Facebook that have chosen that to be your, your way of interacting with this study. And I'm, again, so grateful for your, your mind, your hearts, uh, and of course, the encouragement that I've received as, as we've journeyed through this uh, session, I can say we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. Uh, you, you know, there's ample times where, you, you know, you read through the prophets and I don't know about you, but for me, I sit there and I say, it's very clear. We don't need a very exhaustive sermon series going through this. If you just spend some time reading the prophets and, some, some, and so tonight, I imagine some of the thoughts we'll share uh, should be very familiar should be something that we read and we say, well, of course, yet these are the texts that the apostles leaned upon to outline the resurrection of the dead. And that being said, uh, when we hear our, our, uh, these folks in our society, a lot of Christian teachers talk about this resurrection, about going to heaven and getting a new body when you go to heaven. It doesn't seem to be the point that's being made in the prophets. So hopefully you've been journeying with us and have seen that. This is our part 23 of a, a contextual study on the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. I'm Mike Miano. I've been bringing us through this study. I serve here at the Blue Point Bible Church, and for the sake of this, I serve as the apologetic leader or teacher, if you will, uh, for MGW Apologetics. Back in April of this year, or March of this year, uh, I preached at a conference, Holston PBU Church, and I shared a lecture on rethinking the resurrection, and I provided an outline of Bible verses uh, going through the Old and New Testament that if you want to understand this doctrine, you need to do some studying through. So we've been doing the heavy lifting uh, going through that list, as well as uh, for the book of Isaiah. Uh, we might even call Isaiah resurrection, our resurrection prophet. Um, the Apostle Paul surely alluded to him quite a bit when he outlined the resurrection of the dead. So I don't believe that to be uh, remiss, you know, in our study. So we've spent quite a bit of time here. Uh, I do believe at this point, uh, what we started in Genesis marking out as a fellowship death, as a relationship death, as a covenant death, if you will, uh, has been very clear uh, as we've journeyed through the prophets and seen the lamentation uh, that these prophets are lifting up. So uh, I hope that you've been blessed by this. And uh, of course, I thank each of you that have contributed and have blessed me by your thoughts, your questions, your comments, your concerns uh, in this matter. So uh, we've also leaned upon and, and, you know, how does the phrase go, stood upon the shoulders of giants uh, in great ways here, uh, thinking of men such as Dr. Don K. Preston, uh, Ward Fenley, uh, you know, and many others that, um, you know, have really brought about some great teachings that we've been able to stand upon Dr. William Bell. Um, and that's just a few. Uh, Holger Neubauer uh, has been, you know, a great resource in that regard. Uh, so just, again, so many. Uh, even mentioning names does no justice because there's so many to mention uh, in regards to authors and podcasts and teachings on YouTube. So that being said, <clears throat> let me go ahead and bring us in on a moment of praise and prayer. Uh, of course, trusting the Lord to go before us, bless our study, our fellowship tonight, and then I'll bring us right in on some thoughts for our study. Mighty, gracious, wonderful, powerful, princely God. Lord, we thank you for all that we have in you. We thank you for uh, this Christmas season, Lord, where we have opportunity to ponder love, joy, peace. Uh, almost forgot the Advent candle, Lord. Bring it to me. Love, joy, peace, hope, and Christ, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to possess these things, to increase in them, and to turn to you and thank you for all that you've provided. Lord, here we've had this opportunity to study together in regards to this fundamental, this important doctrine, Lord. As we know, the apostle said he preached nothing other than the hope of Israel. So, uh, Lord, we ask that you bless our study. You continue to bless our study. Uh, you go before us, give us clarity of thought, that we would understand these things, that we would express these things in a clear way so that others might understand them and be blessed by the truth that brings us together. Ultimately, Lord, our relationship with you. We thank you for the repairing, the restoration, the resurrection you've provided. And we ask that you continue to bless us with such insights. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to get us started tonight, I have to say, so earlier today I uh, went by the water and uh, was doing some prayer. Uh, you know, it's a season of increase, if you will. 
and uh, was just sitting by the water, pondering Jesus, sitting by the water and praying. And I looked at the seas, and here in New York, you'd imagine our weather is uh, pretty choppy. Uh, you know, the, 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 the water was not still by any means. And, you know, it was just very choppy. And I, I sat there and I found myself thinking about the raging of the seas. Now, again, you might attribute this to my study of Genesis, Genesis chapters one through two, that we've been doing falling back to Genesis and on our preterist power hour. Or you might ponder some of the things we are, we've unearthed recently in our study, such as Isaiah 48, uh, Isaiah 57. And I'm going to share those texts with you. Before I do that, when you think of the seas raging, what comes to mind? Think about that, write that down, ponder that thought. Uh, earlier today, I had the opportunity to share with my brother and uh, we were talking about this and he said, well, chaos, we both agreed on chaos as our, uh, probably the first thing, you know, you see it and it's just a lot of everything going all over the place. Uh, then when we, after we read these Bible texts, we were able to note, well, restlessness, uh, which is something we note in the book of Revelation, um, excuse me, the book of Genesis, where in the beginning, there's this restless, picture and then ultimately as you conclude that beautiful picture in Genesis 1 and 2 uh, you have rest you have God implementing his reign his rule his rest in the midst of a chaotic creation uh, which prior in ver verse 2 uh, of Genesis chapter 1 we saw it was talking about chaos now might be going ahead of myself that's a study for another time however it relates to the raging of the seas and so we talk about restless and then ultimately as you'll see in these texts another thing would be free Right? They're just free to do as they will, and they just go wherever they want. Let me share with you those texts. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 18 says, If only you had paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. So as I began to ponder this, and I thought, well, well-being is that you know, you're, you're, you're guided, you're ordered, a uh, river we see throughout scripture is ultimately to nourish the things that it comes into contact with. And, uh, you know, rivers always have this sort of, again, ordered uh, picture to them and a benefit. Whereas the waves of the sea, uh, usually in most contexts, it seems to be uh, the raging that they're, you know, they're kind of just chaotic. However, we also must admit that they're free. They're free to go where they will. Now, uh, what we find here, by the time we read into Isaiah 48, and we ultimately know as a New Testament truth, is that Israel, while they might feel as though they're free, uh, they're living in their own ways, doing whatever is right according to their own eyes, uh, we know by no means are they free. Uh, we know Jesus says this. We actually talked through some of the Gospel of John uh, last week, and we know many times, even in John 8, where he tells them that they are not free. They are not uh, the children of Abraham. And we, again, noted the context and the covenant language of those texts. This is one of those texts. So here, uh, you know, if they would have listened to him, their righteousness would have been like the waves of the sea. They would have been able to be free. Uh, however, unfortunately, due to them establishing their own self-righteousness, and this is going to be important as we move in on some of these texts today, their self-righteousness is what has kept them away from God, allowed them not to receive the true righteousness of God, to manifest the true righteousness of God. And as we saw in Isaiah chapter 58, they went about the wrong fast, the wrong sacrifices. You might call that a strange fire, uh, very similar to uh, what we saw early on in uh, the, the story of Israel. The next text that came to mind, of course, and this is more recent in our study, was Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20. And there we read, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. Now, again, I'm reading out of the NASB translation. Uh, so uh, many Bibles say, uh, for they cannot find rest or cannot or will not find rest. Um, but it cannot be quiet. Or some say cannot be stilled. Uh, that's another or, you know, made to be still uh, for that matter. So the wicked are like the tossing of the sea. They cannot find rest. They cannot be quieted. They cannot made to be still. Uh, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. So what we see here is restlessness chaos and restlessness, if you will, and the product being a mess. So we talked about before with the river the contrast in Isaiah 48, where the river is ordered and is a blessing to that which it comes into contact with. Imagine coming into contact with a wave that uh, tosses up 
refuse and mud. I don't know that I have to paint that picture for us, that it's not exactly a pretty picture. So uh, just interesting thoughts here. And then, you know, how does this lead in on our talk tonight? Well, as I'm journeying through Isaiah, I'm noticing, well, there's two pictures. There's the picture of the man that desires his own righteousness, goes about trying to foster his own righteousness, and ultimately include, uh, you know, leans upon his own understanding. And as we're seeing here in the story of Israel, welcomes in idolatry, makes excuses for his mistakes, rather than repenting. And this has earned the Lord's anger and the Lord's wrath. So there's that type of a man. And then there's a man where he's ordered by God. He he's, listens to the commandments. He finds rest in the Lord. Dare I say what David said in Psalm 46, verse 10, stop striving and know that I am God, or many of us know, be still and know that I am God. And I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted on the earth. So we might say going all the way back to the days of David, God had been giving the wisdom to his people to stop, to stop striving for their own righteousness, to simply be still and recognize God was going before them. God would be their strength. God would be their arm. God would be all these mighty things that they needed and that they unfortunately made covenants with the nations around them in regards to finding. Again, we lament what we read there in Isaiah 4, uh, 27 about the uh, death covenant that Israel makes with the nations around them, which again highlights their self-righteousness. They're being righteous in their own eyes. Uh, we see in Isaiah 58, what do they do? Well, they know they're guilty. They know that they're sinners before God. So instead of making amends and doing the right things, they begin to put their own version of fig leaves upon themselves to kind of carry the context there from the story of Genesis forward. They walk in their own self-righteousness rather than in the, the animal skins that the Lord had given them, uh, that old covenant picture there. So as I'm journeying further here in Isaiah, I'm just seeing this continued beautiful theme of these two people. Uh, one that incurs the wrath of God and one that it will uh, be blessed by the righteousness of God and ultimately will be blessed by the rest of God. We'll have well-being like a river and righteousness like the waves of the sea. So I say that because I see uh, that that's going to be where we're going to pick up in our reading tonight in Isaiah 60 through 61, where we're going to see the on the heels of the despair, on the heels of the uh, those that are not walking in the obedience, we're going to see the promise for those that have been provided the righteousness of God. As we remember in 50, let's say 50 through uh, 54 through 58, we read quite a few texts that were used by the apostles to talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, so we understand Jesus to be the hope of Israel, Jesus to be the resurrection as he said he was. Uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of these things that we're reading about here in the prophets. So when we move in on Isaiah 60 through 61, ask yourself, are these things that we're waiting for or these things that we are privileged to represent and have in our lives today? Uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. If I might bring your mind back just in a matter of quick review here uh, to Isaiah chapter 59, verses 9 through 15. And I believe these will uh, set the stage for our discussion tonight. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness, for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like the doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us, and our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, and justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the street and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself prey. Interesting conviction upon Israel. I think that last verse really just caught me tonight. Uh, you know, that uh, he who 
uh, turns aside from evil. He who desires to walk in the truth is oftentimes a prey for uh, those wicked people, those the wicked doers. And uh, unfortunately, even to our current day, we see some that uh, desire to turn away from false teaching, desire to turn away from evil doing, and unfortunately are persecuted by those wicked people that would keep them there in that bondage. And away from, uh, dare I say, where justice is turned back, where righteousness stands far away, truth uh, stumbles in the street and uprightness does not enter. So just an interesting uh, rebuke upon some tonight uh, that, you know, really just stuck 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 out there we go stuck out to me as i was uh, reading that text so on the heels of that now we noticed again we went through this study on isaiah 58 through 59 we noticed uh, at the end of 59 there's this talk of a covenant uh that he will have a covenant where you put his spirit upon them and we know that that is used in the new testament both verses 20 and 21 are used in the new testament by the apostles to talk of jesus and the new covenant so now moving in on 60 uh, it, it shouldn't surprise us that we read covenant terms right in the very first few verses uh, of the text. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the text on the screen, and we'll move in on our reading of Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all are gathered together, they come to you, your sons from come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense. They will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Whose are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to to their lattices. Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first, to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be, continu will be open continually, they will not close day or night, so that men may bring you to the wealth of nations. Excuse me, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. The sons who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Now, I have to stop there just for a brief moment, and hopefully you notice what I just read to you in Isaiah 59 verses 9 through 15 is being reversed here in Isaiah chapters, uh, chapter 61 verses 1 through 14. Uh, it's just what we're seeing is the complete reverse of those things. For example, uh, I mentioned again, arise and shine. We saw that in Isaiah 59, that their light had become darkness. So here with this new covenant, now we see arise and shine, arise, resurrection phrase there. Uh, we know in the New Testament, uh, standing upright. And I believe we've noted this in this study here as well, that standing upright is a resurrection phrase. Uh, I believe the uh, phrase would either be... Um, Anastasis, or there's another Anna word or something to that effect uh, that's not coming to mind for me right now. Um, however, um, yes, it is Anastasis, by the way. So uh, as I'm thinking, I'm thinking of apontesis would be another word that sounds familiar that's used in 1 Thessalonians 4, but conversation for another time. Uh, we will get there. Um, that being said, arise, shine. 
I don't know that I would have to argue with folks that this is new covenant language. We've seen it through the prophets so far. Uh, we've seen it in the book of Isaiah. If you need proof text, I would tell you Genesis 1. If you wanted to argue with that, I would tell you 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, where we see a new covenant language there, children of the day, children of the light. Uh, John 1, <laughs> and then Revelation 21 through 22, where as I was reading this, I know some of you uh, started to think immediately. Uh, but before I get there, matter of fact, uh, verse 2, uh, if you notice, it says, uh, the darkness will cover the earth, the deep darkness, the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. His glory will appear upon you. Um, that wasn't what I wanted to read. I, I wanted to, uh, th that's important though, because again, notice the word glory. Uh, and nations will come to you, uh, your light, the kings of uh, the brightness of your rising. Uh, this is, matter of fact, Revelation 21. Uh, we see uh, there in 21 and 22 that the, uh, they will bring the glory of the kings into the city. Uh, that, you know, the people will go out and they will bring the glory of the kings into the city. So uh, this is what Israel was supposed to be. If you remember, uh, looking at verse five is where I wanted us to look. Uh, then you will see and be radiant. And your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. So this is that point there, that the nations, the kings will come to Israel. They will be what we read in Isaiah chapter two, if you remember. A city will be set up, the Lord's temple, tabernacle will be set up, and uh, the nations will stream to it and say, teach us your ways. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. So what we're seeing here is, is this picture of how Israel can become the kingdom of God, can become the people of God, can be identified, if you will. That's going to be very important as we move in on the New Testament, that identity picture there, having an identity of shame versus having an identity of glory. And as we move in on the New Testament, a lot of what we're saying about the old covenant dead uh, and their identity of shame or glory, or whether they have a promise of a shame of glory, uh, is going to be an important question that comes up. So um, mark that out as important, identity. And if you want a little bit of a hint, the word body uh, is, you know, again, uh, synonymous with the word identity. Uh, we'll talk more about that. However, here in this text, so we see the nations coming to Israel after this time of uh, God turning away his wrath. And now the nations are willing to come in. And why? Because in verse 9, uh, we read uh, in the latter portion of the verse, it says, For the name of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel has glorified you. And this, for me, brought my thoughts right away to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, where the apostle says, What is the hope of glory? Christ in us, uh, Christ in his church, Christ's kingdom manifesting from his people. And, uh, you know, it wasn't very hard, even for my younger brother, as we read through this text earlier today, for my brother to notice, well, what you're reading here is the transition of a people. It's a picture of a people that God is angry with, uh, and then a people that have been forgiven and God is no longer angry with, which we read in the text. Uh, verse 10, uh, for in my wrath, I struck you, and in my favor, I've had compassion on you. And then he goes in and says some interesting details here in 11 through 14, uh, which ironically enough, we've, we're in the same part of this study in our adult Sunday school here at Blue Point. So uh, we ended it at verse 14 because of the amount of, uh, you know, new covenant details that are found here in this text. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it and elaborate as I'm reading and your gates will be open continually. I mean, this takes us to Revelation 21. If you haven't already been there uh, in our study, this would take you there. Uh, we read of the city where the gates are always open. Um, so they will be a city where their gates will be always open. They will not be closed day or night so that men may bring the wealth of nations with their kings led in procession. And again, why would this be important? Well, do you remember what the night looked like for Old Covenant Israel? Uh, it meant war. It meant darkness. Darkness and war, nighttime are times of war, uh, you know, where they had to be afraid, had to be alert, uh, could not rest. And uh, that's why we read in the New Covenant, in the New Testament there in the New Jerusalem, there is no night uh, for it's always day. Uh, so here, uh, notice what it's saying that there, there's a, obviously a prophetic, the prophet didn't see the full picture yet. He says there, they will not be closed day or night. We know that there is no night there. That's something we know in hindsight bias from reading Revelation 21 through 22. Uh, however, these gates will not be closed. That's the point. 
And the reason why Israel's gates were always closed in the old covenant was because they were always at war, war with God, so to speak, and there were nations constantly coming upon them. They were never at rest because they were walking in their own self-righteousness. So what you're seeing here is a promise of not only righteousness, but that righteousness will cause them to be a people who no longer have to constantly close their gates because they're afraid. Now they can actually live as the light of the nations and open up their gates and invite the nations in. And uh, of course, we know this is a new covenant promise. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish. The nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you. The juniper, the box tree, the cypress together. Right there, of course, is a lot of language in there. Uh, tree language is something I'm currently studying. In the back room before our study tonight, uh, Edward had brought up a, a gentleman named Dallas Kablaika, and he has some great videos at Better Understanding the Bible going through tree language, just focusing on that alone and seeing the imagery that can be brought up. So that verse alone, you know, the glory of Lebanon, we know about the cedars of Lebanon uh, will come to you the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. So that for me was the, the, you know, one of my dots in my Bible. That's the important point right there. All of this is being done. These na nations are coming in to do what? To beautify the place of God's presence, which we know was the goal of the Garden of Eden picture, was the goal of God giving Israel the law in Deuteronomy chapter four, uh, and is ultimately the, the glory of the new covenant that it, it does transcend uh, Jew and Gentile uh, and different borders uh, that would be made within those different groups. Uh, so it's all about the, to beautify the place of his sanctuary, his presence, and he shall make the place of his feet glorious. Another, uh, there's a New Testament verse that for some reason is coming to mind, but I'm not uh, marking it out appropriately when I read that text. Uh, and then of course, uh, just to kind of finalize my point here in verse 14, and the sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing, and those who despised you will bow themselves at the sole of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Again, bringing you right back to Isaiah chapter 2, uh, and of course, bringing us into Revelation chapter 21 through 22, where we read about the city that comes from the Lord, the Zion of God, uh, the New Jerusalem, which the Apostle Paul, uh, if you find yourself reading Revelation, it's great to know that the Apostle Paul, prior to the book of Revelation, had already explained what the New Jerusalem was in Galatians chapter four. So, um, you know, that's the new covenant and, and that's what he made clear there. So right here, I have to already mention, you know, there's just a lot to, you know, talk about, there's a lot to unearth, but I hope that you're seeing the picture of this, this sort of covenant transition and the way that uh, God is making this known. If I might just continue in our reading here, and then I might make a couple more points, and then I'm interested to hear more from you than to do much more expounding. So uh, let's continue in our reading at verse 15. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated. Now remember, keep in mind everything we've talked about here, this picture of shame and, and dishonor uh, you know, uh, that Israel had because of their sin and their lack of producing the righteousness of God. And their identity, and this is their identity at this point. You have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through. I will make you, here's the promise, an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. This is exactly what we were just reading in the verses prior, where he will set them up now as the Zion of God, as the, the kingdom of God, uh, the city where the gates are always open. Verse 16, you will suck at the milk of the nations and suck at the breast, the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver, and instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron, and I will make peace your administrators and righteousness your overseers. Right there, for me, it made a uh, very important point was that this is not talking about a government of men. This is talking about a government where the peace is the administrator and righteousness is the overseer. Uh, for me, that shows that it was a hint, at least, about the kingdom of God transcending, you know, natural ways men would uh, order their own kingdom. Violence will not be heard in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. If you weren't thinking again of Revelation 21, I'm sure I've, I've already kind of got you thinking in that manner. Uh, we talk about the walls and the gates that are all set up in this city, that the, the gates are open. No longer will you have the sun for light, 
by day, nor the brightness of the moon to give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Now, many of you know that's Revelation 22. I forget what verse, uh, that there will be no sun or moon, but the Lord will be the light of the city. There it is, your cross-reference, Isaiah 60, 19. Your sun will no longer set, your moon will no, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. There's your hope. Then all the people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. And of course, we know in Isaiah 11, we've already did some reading about this stem, this branch. Uh, we've read about this in quite a few other texts in Isaiah. Uh, we know the apostles pointed out this is Jesus. The smallest one will become a clan and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. And I just want to go ahead and launch us into 61 as I studied through this text with my younger brother today. Uh, this was the way we went about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue reading, marking out the points, share some resources and hear from the rest of you. Verse one, the spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who, are, who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting, so they will be called the oaks of righteousness. Now, if I might stop there for a moment, if you read along with me those verse two, first two verses of this chapter, and you've spent just a little bit of time reading the Gospels, you know that this is the verse that Jesus used to talk about himself and his ministry. So, again, I, I brag about my younger brother because, you know, while he's not a astute Bible student or on here teaching videos on, on the Internet, I'll tell you what, when I read that, he said, oh, yeah, it's Jesus. That's talking about Jesus. You know, he understood it. So, you know, no matter where you're at in your Bible reading, you should be able to, again, and if you don't see that, might I compel you and encourage you to do some basic reading of the Gospels so that this language would become that familiar to you. So here you see this, we, we already have hindsight bias that this is talking to Jesus. This is talking to the time where the spirit of God would be evident in that generation. Now, again, I've talked about this, that I believe that this would have been what Israel was expecting when they came out of Babylon, when they began to set up their temple. Uh, there's no doubt about it that that would have been the time they believed this was the fulfillment of the promise. Look, the nations are helping us build. You remember that text that we just read there in uh, 60, where it talks about they will help us build. Well, yeah, amen. They were helping them build. The nations around them were helping them build. Uh, matter of fact, if I might bring our attention, uh, verse 10, and foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. So, you know, I do believe that uh, there would have been this idea that when they came out of ba uh, Babylon, that that was the fulfillment of that promise. Uh, however, uh, just like the days of uh, Seth being born to Adam and Eve, well, that was not it. That was not the favorable time just yet for uh, the fulfillment of their promise. Uh, we know Genesis 3.15, right? The, uh, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Well, Seth did not accomplish that, uh, nor did uh, Zerubbabel, uh, you know, the man who restored uh, Israel back to uh, from Babylon. So uh, these were not the messiahs. These were not the men that uh, and they were not provided up until the time of Jesus. And that's why Jesus uses this prophecy in an inspired fashion to show that this is speaking of him. So again, notice the nature of this, verse three, or the point, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland of ashes, a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. That sure sounds like good news to me. Uh, that's what, you know, that's the gospel. You might say Genesis 61 verses one through three in the very least are the gospel. It's, the, you know, that's what they were hoping for. That's the good news right there. And then when we find out what Isaiah 61 verses one through three are talking about Jesus, we then understand the hope of Israel. And we understand how it was provided through Jesus. So here we notice 
And again, hopefully what you're catching out of my point in this study is for us to constantly ask ourselves, well, then what was the goal? If Jesus is the Messiah, he is the fulfillment of the hope of Israel. What was all of the, all these texts that talk of him and point to him, what do they say the goal of the hope of Israel being fulfilled was? And, you know, to let the cat out of the bag and that, many of you know, I believe it's the church. It's our identity in Christ. It's the living, the dead, the asleep, all of us gathered into this beautiful picture of the new covenant as an ongoing, ongoing excuse me, eternal kingdom of God. So that's how I, I interpret this next part here. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then, now notice this, this is where we get in, you want to talk about uh, answers. We talked about this a couple uh, sessions ago. Answers to the question, uh, well, then what are we supposed to do next? If you remember in Isaiah 58, we talked about uh, the repairers, restorers, raisers, you know, raising up recoverers. Notice this. And by the way, uh, Brother Ward Fenley at Prospect Baptist Church about two years ago, I'll share the link in our update for this week. He really, you know, uh, they what do they say? Waxed an elephant, uh, you know, uh, with this text. I remember doing a word study on that whole thing there on how he came up with waxed an elephant and waxing eloquent and how that whole thing works together. But he really did a great job um, going through uh, this text. Notice the power of it. After they become the planting of the Lord and the oaks of righteousness, verse four, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. By the way, if you're reading this, you're probably saying to yourself, this is exactly, exactly what we read in Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, let me double check there. Yeah, you know, giving... Uh, they will build up the, the desolation, Isaiah 58 and 59, for that matter. Um, just have to make note of it. I'm probably going to do the cross-referencing on my own time. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair ruined cities, the desolation of many nations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God excuse me, you will eat the wealth of nations and in their riches, you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Notice that uh, there you have a reference there of the uh, shame and glory picture right in front of you, Isaiah 61, verse seven. Instead of your shame, you will have double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. They will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. And I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will know, will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring of whom, of whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks herself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. I mean, hopefully you notice tonight, as we're reading through Isaiah chapter 60 through 61, this is essentially the gospel. That's what we're reading. This is, you know, and these texts are quoted all throughout the New Testament uh, to highlight the truth of the gospel. So uh, I might mention, uh, and I'm interested to hear, as I said, from uh, the rest of you, um, I would really mention this is a picture of God's glory, a picture of the kingdom of God. And there's men that have done these teachings already. So, uh, I mentioned Ward Fenley speaking at Prospect Baptist Church. I also have to mention, uh, if you listen to that and you know you find Ward to be uh, you know encouraging to you, I'd encourage you to check out his YouTube channel. He actually has a session where he went through and exegeted Isaiah chapter sixty-one himself. So uh, rather than you know go ahead and teach all that to you, I would tell you to go over there and give him a, a good listen. And then also our brother Dr. Don K. Preston, he's preached on. Isaiah chapter 61 a bit, 60 and 61, 
in talking about the kingdom of God. It was just uh, this morning, he did one of his morning musings, number 730, whatever it was, of uh, his going through the Olivet Discourse. I mean, give the man praise for going through that teaching in depth. And uh, here he is in his 730s, I believe it is, uh, talking about Isaiah 2 and connecting the prophecies of, again, he had talked about Isaiah 60 back in 300 and something of that session. Uh, however, he's bringing it right back to Isaiah 2 and marking out the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, so some really great insights there. Uh, I encourage you to uh, keep an eye out for our resource link, and I'll provide uh, all of what I've just mentioned to you. I'll provide the links to those sessions, and who knows? Maybe I'll share some notes from uh, our discussion that we're about to have here in a moment. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute some mics, and I'm interested to hear uh, what you're seeing. Are you seeing this theme? Uh, what, what are some points that stood out to you in the text? Please feel free to jump in and share your thoughts. Yes, when he talks about um, uh, the people of God will have the wealth of the nations and, you know, how they will prosper and stuff like that. That brings me to that verse where it talks about um, you will eat and they will be hungry. You will, you, 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 you will be quenched and they will be thirsty mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and then um, how, uh, how we read previously, I have to paraphrase about how the nations will, you know, come to them and like bow down before them and things of this nature uh, because they have the glory of God and things of this nature. They went from shame to glory, you know. So that's what I was thinking as well. Amen. And then with the, to, to, the, with, the, with the raging waves and stuff, you know what that brought me to? When Jesus was sleeping on the boat <laughs> and they were crossing the Jordan or something like that. Uh, uh, you can, Jesus was demonstrating peace in the, midst, in the midst of a storm, you know, like that, you know, because he told them, you know, that they would make it to the other side, you know, not that, you know, that I understand Jesus, you know, calmed the sea for them, you know, for their, for their benefit, but he said that they would make it to the other, to the other side, you know, but, you know, they, they saw the waves and stuff and it was really scaring them, things of this nature, so they woke him. You know, but he demonstrated peace in the midst of a storm. Amen. Anyone else have any thoughts you want to jump in and share? Verse uh, 21, chapter 60, verse 21, and all your people will be righteous and they will possess the land forever. Um, and the branch of my planting, like those are all such a, well, so I take like that first phrase, then all your people will be righteous is like a very plainly stated purpose of God. Like there's so much symbolism here and we have light and darkness and, you know, yeah. like you're saying waves and you know, we have still waters and um, here's just like very plainly stated in verse 21, like I almost uncharacteristically stated the goal of, of, of God's work is to make all of his people righteous. Right. And then let's go ahead. They would be called the children of Zion. Yeah, that reminds me of the other one that caught my eyes. The Zion of the Holy One of Israel back in verse uh, 14. Um, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So you know how in, in Galatians 6, I think it is, um, Paul refers to the Israel of God. So here we have the Zion of God. Zion, Mount Zion was a natural mountain, right? I mean, it's an actual, I know it's usually has a uh, eschatological, I think, uh, flavor to it when you see the word Zion in scripture, but it is a, it is a natural place. Sure. But the, here's the Zion of, of God is like the, tur the Israel of God, the spiritual Zion, right? It's also a connection to uh, Hebrews 12, 22 in that verse. Matt, you care to elaborate a bit on that, please? Um, it's just going along the same lines as Simon was saying. Uh, they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. 
in the book of Hebrews, the author is saying you haven't come to, you know, a mountain where you're trembling, but you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, kind of similar picture, you know, similar language. Yeah, amen. And, and I'm sorry, uh, Simon, if I could ask you, can you tell me the verse that you were you're pointing out to in Isaiah? The 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 Zion of the Holy One of Israel is in verse or chapter sixty, verse fourteen. It's the very end of the verse. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Amen. And Matt, I, I definitely appreciate your point there about. Uh, obviously, we know when we get into the Book of Hebrews, and we will have to go there. Uh, we do see some resurrection imagery, in my opinion, in the very least in Hebrews eleven verses thirty nine through forty, I believe it is. So we'll definitely have to be looking at the Book of Hebrews. Uh, in our study. And uh, yeah, we see a lot of that pointing out again, the kingdom of God, the new covenant, uh, and, you know, hopefully a good uh, a truth that is the outworking of what we're talking about here. But um, yeah, I was going to share something as well, if Simon was all set. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I uh, like this chapter so much is um, this is where everything in revelation 21 comes from <laughs> it's like there's at least like five citations uh but um the one that stands out to me is uh verse 19 and 20 um especially verse 20 the 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 end there um cuz this reminds me of revelation 21 4 um that basically everyone knows every futurist every 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 christian knows that verse that you know there will be no more death no more sorrow no more pain that kind of thing and um i would say it's a difficult verse to understand especially for a futurist you know um they're they're thinking literal um and I'm not sure how you understand that verse, but the way, if I'm looking at this Isaiah verse here, um, this actually sheds, I, I feel like Isaiah 20 sheds a lot of light on, on that verse in Revelation, um, because in Revelation, it just says there will be no more death. There will be like, it's just, it, it will, it doesn't say, it doesn't use the words that Isaiah uses here. It just says there will be no more. Um, but Isaiah says that the days of your mourning will be over. And I feel like that kind of paints a different picture, a, a picture that I think Revelation is trying to, to paint. But like the, you know, as we've been reading I, through Isaiah, um, we've, you know, we've been seeing this uh, sort of theme of, I mean, you actually went through it a little bit today when you were reading um, what were you reading again? Was it 58 or 59? Yeah. You're reading 59. Yeah. Yeah. 59. When, when he was talking about like the justice is not there and, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's sin and there's, um, you know, and there's, um, you know, basically they're, they're not, uh, with God. They're, um, what am I trying to say? They're, you see that picture of like that they're not where, where they should be. And then you also have these chapters like this, uh, where there's like promises of restoration, you know, that we're sort of tying to and correlating to the resurrection. Um, and so like when you see, when you see all of that, and then you come to verse 20 here and it's just like, yeah, so everything that you're going through, uh, there will come a time where the days of your mourning will be over the days of your pain will be over the days of your crying will be over just replace those words in revelation you know like it, that's what revelation i that's at least how i understand it that's what revelation is trying to say that like look look at revelation like it's this all this tribulation this terrible stuff and then at the end you know it's like okay now it's over like the true basically the tribulation that you went through is done like right. you can now now you can rest that's kind of how i understand that and i feel like this verse these two verses in isaiah it just it for me and i think it also just sheds a lot of light you know on on that verse in revelation just to kind of understand it better yeah amen well said you know and absolutely i think 
Uh, I would correlate what we're reading there in verse 20 with, and the days of your mourning will be finished. I think your exact, your exact point would be, uh, that sounds exactly right, like what we're reading in Revelation, where it says, uh, the first things have passed away, right? So there shall be no longer any mourning or crying or pain and death, of course. Uh, the first things have passed away. Well, what were the first things? The first things was the old covenant, the law, that covenant. Did what? It magnified their debt, their sin to the point that it produced death, right? We see, uh, what is that? Um, Galatians chapter three, uh, three and four, the apostle Paul explaining the goal of the law was to magnify transgression. So the point would be the first thing was, yes, the, the, the fact that they became harlots, we see the indictment of the prophets that they're harlots. And then by the time we get to revelation, uh, you're absolutely right. That is the wrath of the wrath of God upon the harlot, uh, Babylon, where, you know, we're seeing that wrathfully. Um, a lot of the language we've been reading in these latter chapters of Isaiah talked about God being angry, contending with the people, having a wrath toward the people. And, you know, again, as I've mentioned, I think they may have hoped for that to be the reality when they came out of Babylon. However, by the time of the first century, we see Jesus Christ making that clear that it's speaking of him in the new covenant. So, yeah, Pastor, I'm not far from it. We're, we're here mentioned that uh, <clears throat> he would remove that heavy yoke from, from upon them, you know, because his, his yoke is easy, his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen. You know, so that, pro, that, that law where, you know, they had that condemnation, you know, they still had, you know, uh, to sacrifice every year and things of this nature. So through Jesus Christ, he was the, that one sacrifice once and for all. And, and through uh, believing in him and, and, and things of this nature, you pass from death to life and there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's that, and then you have that peace that surpass all understanding and things of this nature. So, you know, it should be no more mourning and tears and things of that nature in that regard, you know, that you have that hope in Christ. You know? Right. In the covenantal fashion, as you know, I marked out, Simon marked out. I think we, we all would agree that we're seeing this, a lot of imagery happening here, light, darkness, um, peace, as Edward brought up, peace and joy are uh, phrases that, you know, are used all throughout the Bible to talk of the covenants. Uh, co a covenant of shame, a covenant that brought tears versus a covenant of joy and peace, uh, as Edward's rightly marking out there. If I might mention also on the heels of that, um, talking about the gospel uh, and, you know, how this is pointing to the truth of the gospel. In verse uh, six of Isaiah 61, uh, we read, but you will be called. This is now notice. This is the hope after God has extinguished his wrath. And after he has now restored them to their hope, it says, you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. I couldn't help because of my recent study to notice that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4. He says they will regard us as I'm going to go ahead and turn there in my Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I mentioned verse 1. It says, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So I realized when I was reading this text earlier about the pre, and again, we know by the time you're reading Revelation, I appreciate Matt uh, mentioned that there, but in Revelation, you're going to notice the people of God, the church are called what? Priests and kings. Exactly. So, uh, you know, and ministers of our God is exactly what the apostle Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 4.1. We are servants of Christ and servants of the truth of God. So in Christ, the apostles are understanding the living believers to be this promise. That to be the, the, you know, again, Jesus didn't say, I will be the resurrection. He was the resurrection. And as Edward rightly pointed out, men that were living, put their faith in him and believed in him, moved from death to life. So they were able to experience resurrection of the dead. Yes, uh, in that very moment. However, we know that there's going to be an eschatological resurrection of the dead in the first century that is going to be, obviously, we're going to get in on that. But I want us to just see, this is texts that are simply speaking to the truth of the gospel, that if we believe in Jesus Christ, 
We're not waiting to be oaks of righteousness. We're living as oaks of righteousness. And we're not waiting for any of this. You know, this isn't some sort of city God is going to create in the future. This is the new covenant city that God has provided for his people. So uh, real quickly, I wanted to make sure I go back to Matt. Matt, uh, I know we might have further exhausted some of your points beyond what you wanted to mention there, but wanted to make sure that you felt that uh, we were still on track with what you were saying and your thinking. Oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, that's all I really had. All right. Um, that was, that's really what stood out to me and uh, just wanted to chat about that. Um, but you mentioned verse 6 and 61. Um, what the, actually the verse that stood out to me in the new Testament was first Peter two, nine, ah, right. um, regarding that verse where he says that you are priests. Um, and then he says that, that you would proclaim the, the excellencies of the, of the one who calls you into light. So that would be like the ministers, ministers of yeah. God. Yeah. That's um, the beautiful text where he talks about, uh, out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is what we're kind of reading here too. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, Alvin and you, I wanted to share a little something, but I want you guys to speak first. Can I just jump in real quick and ask Matt, Matt what that first Peter reference was? I missed that. First. Two nine. Two nine. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, amen. All right. Well, uh, let me go ahead and uh, do some rounds. I know, Edward, you said you wanted to mention some there. I want to make sure we give everyone an opportunity to exhaust some thoughts. And by the way, uh, I know as I was reading this, I do want to say, uh, I know that as I was reading this, I was like, we could spend the rest of the year, and, you know, ha, 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 uh, the rest of the year just in this text alone. Um, obviously, there's a lot to be exhausted. I know for myself, as I read through this, by the way, I read through this three times today, and I mo made notes. As I read through it live with you just now, I sat there and said, I don't even know if I've ever studied this. You know, just so much more stood out to me than when I was reading it, you know, the first couple of times. So I want to encourage all of us, you know, take some time in the, this week and really go through this text again. We're, we're going to journey further, obviously, next week. However, I won't be surprised if we all come together next week saying, oh, man, I got a list of, I made a chart out of my citations. You know, that might be a challenge to someone. Um, but, you know, I know I'm going to be working on that as well. Because there's just so much in Isaiah 60 and 61 that needs to be unearthed that can be talked about tonight. So um, I want to acknowledge that tonight and encourage you to really do some studying this week on this text. Uh, however, not closing us down, just wanted to mention that. Um, Vicki or Alvin, uh, did either of you have something you wanted to jump in here and uh, share with us and bless us with? Well, I may just say this. We'll talk about the glory of Lebanon, our 13th verse. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be as the fur and the pine and the box together uh, of course the basis of that they're all evergreens uh, they stay green the year round and, and for that it's been quickened and made alive to God we're evergreens mm. amen we're alive I, and uh, we ought to be sh showing our greenery all year round so. You know, the oak tree can look awful dead and pitiful in the wintertime. Uh, and it looks beautiful and strong in the summer. But mm. uh, the pine and the boxwood and the fir, they, they keep her beauty all year long. Hmm. That's good to know. I think, would you say that it's appropriate correlation then to Revelation 21, where we see uh, the leaves of the tree are producing uh, year round, right? That the trees produce fruit year round, etc. Don't wither. Right. Amen. Amen. So again, I, I think we would Put agree. A, and the thing is, they shed off their needles uh, and all that, but they still keep their greenery uh, the full year round. Hmm. That's why they use those for Christmas trees and for the wreaths and stuff, because they show their greenery. Uh, don't show something dead, it shows something living. Amen. Gospel. There we go. <laughs> That's right. That, that, that is it. Again, and you see it. That's the beauty of his place, his sanctuary, the place where he has put his feet. Is that not the reality of the church to be a, a place of life, constant growth? Uh, dare I say a time of shedding? Uh, you know, there's, there's ample time for all of that. You know, I was thinking of a sermon as you were speaking, Alvin, about, 
you know, times where uh, I've thought something was dead or dying. Meanwhile, when I was younger, they told me, no, that's just the snake shedding its skin. And, uh, you know, there's something to be said about that, but that's probably more sermon. When, when, it, when it comes out of the old hide, it'll be shiny. That's right. Amen. That's the right. old might be getting dull looking, but when it peels it off, uh, it'll be the shiniest that it's been all year long. That's right. That's right. Over the clan, ain't nothing filthy on it. Amen. The glory of Lebanon. Let me say something. I told this to uh, to uh, William Bell one time, and he says, I promise you I'll end up using this. Uh, we were talking about the communion, the foot washing, and all that. And there was a good friend of mine. I wasn't there to hear it, but I, as soon as I heard it, I knew what he was saying. He was talking about the, the washing of feet. Uh, and he took it, and you think about this, we're, we've, we're coming out of the old and we're entering into a new house, to a new building. You build you a new house. You don't want nobody walking in with dirty shoes in it to start with. That's right. You got a good clean white house. Uh, the washing of that feet was to get the rediments of the old off of them before entering in the new that you'd not track the mm -hmm. old into the new. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see that might Edward sort of perk up a little. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Amen. That's well, that's the gospel. That's it. Uh, he was right. preparing them for the entrance into the kingdom. That's right. Amen. Amen. Just like just like when she uh broke the alabaster box open and put the the perfume on his feet and wiped it with her hair. You know, he, Jesus said, you know, she was tears dried it with her glory, didn't she? Yeah, preparing for his uh his burial or something like that, she said. So, uh, yeah. She was a good figure of the church. The church washes his feet with her tears and dries them with her glory, which is her heart. That's well, you know, in line with what we've been sharing here, I, I would say that that's a beautiful picture of the resurrection promise. If it's not, you know, what it starts with, with shame and ultimately ends in glory. Uh, I mean, that's what we're, we're seeing this picture of the of recovery and repair, if you will, uh, is a picture of shame and glory. So, yeah. Amen. I want to give Vicky opportunity. Uh, Vicky, just want to give you that moment. If you wanted to jump in here and, and share a thought, please go ahead and do so. Pastor, can you define the significance of do not mix the new wine with the old wine that is something about the new covenant and the old covenant yeah i believe the context that you're asking about would be the wine skins um oh. putting the uh old wine in new wine skins uh, i think is the uh, concept there or putting yeah so what's the wine wine significance um well obviously we know you know uh that it's talking of covenants, we know that, you know, a little hindsight bias there uh, would be that it's speaking of the covenants, not mixing and diluting the covenants one with another. We know the problem in the first century by and large was the Judaizers endeavoring to do exactly that. Um, however, uh, there's a lot that could be said about that, Vicki, uh, to be clear. Um, I don't want to uh, say too much or say too little. So um, I will say that that is speaking to the covenants and that we are not to uh I'm trying to remember the imagery there if anybody else remembers it there on the wine skins please jump in and uh, share your thoughts but there's something to uh, something about putting I don't know if it's new wine and old skins or something but anyway the skin would burst right right it burst yeah. something to do with that I'm not remembering off the top of my head go ahead has has something, to to something, something with the old clothing and the new clothing right Simon, yeah. you're going to yeah. That's right. When uh, Vicky was just talking about clothes, like the sewing in a, a patch on clothes is another. Yes. Metaphor, but yeah. Like with the new wine, it's still fermenting, right? So you put the wine in the wine skins and it stretches the skins. But once they've stretched so much, they won't stretch anymore. So you put the, if you put the new wine in the old wine skins, then it would break those wine skins instead uh -huh. of stretching. Now, this is just something I was told. I don't know anything about the science there, but that sounds about right. To what I've taught, been taught as well. So, um, does that help, Vicky? 
Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll do some digging. And if uh, we, we, we need to lean in on that a bit more, I'll, I'll uh, have a better exegete for you. Okay. Get out. Alvin, you can got I something? Put in, can I put in two cents uh, right quick? Sure, please. If you want to put in 25, go ahead. <laughs> you may not have time for 20. may not have time for 25. <laughs> uh, when you take about the says the Lord told him, says, you know, you don't put uh, new patches on old garments. Mm. And you know that you don't uh, put new wine in old bottles because that old bottle is hardened and of course it'll burst. The new patches on old garment, you can patch it up, but it's going to tire back off the old and you're only going to make the tire worse. Mm. Now then, here's the thing. He was telling them, you know better than that. Do you think do you not think that I know better than to put new patches on an old covenant or to put new wine in the old bottle? I'm going to make a new creature out of you. Yeah, it's the making of all things new. Amen. 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 Do you think I don't know no better than that? I know better. You know better than that, but I know better than you do. Amen. I'm not going to put it in something old. I'm going to put it in something that's not going to make worse. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to make it new. That's right. And then being that it's new, you don't want to go back to the old. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, I think the, you know, the, the message behind all that it was just that, you know, there was, there's really no place for the old covenant law in the new covenant as yeah. because in the new covenant, righteousness is by faith, right? Right. And the old covenant you know, those who um, kept the law would live by the law, but in the new covenant, it works. right, just live by faith. So there was a, a lot of tension in the new covenant about, you know, some Jews that would believe, but they wanted to retain the old covenant and they wanted to add yeah. Jesus to the law. And, and uh, you know, they, they, were, they were saying in those times that, you know, the resurrection had already happened and they were saying, well, we've already been restored to God's presence, but, you know, Paul was saying, no, the, you know, the old covenant is still operating. And when the resurrection comes, that old body has to die and there has to be a clean break. Just like at the transfiguration where he had Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And I think it was Peter, one, one of the, one of the apostles or disciples was like, let's make three tabernacles. And then the cloud overshadowed them. And, and, uh, Moses and Elijah disappeared and, and just Christ was left. And the Lord said that, you know, this is my son, you know, listen to, listen to him. Also, pastor, it has something to do with under the new covenant in the first century, some people are advising another group to be circumcised. Right. Well, yeah, that would be exactly what Simon was speaking about. There it was basically the problem with the Judaizers. Yes. In verse 60, in chapter 61, you know, verse 1 through where it talks about what, what Jesus came to do as far as, you know, uh, bring good news to the humble mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, right? Um, that's our job today to continue in his work because that's where the Pharisees failed, you know, because the people that, Je that Jesus is talking about healing and uh, restoring and and encouraging and things of this nature those are the people that the pharisees ostracize consider consider as dead you know so it is is it's the opposite of what jesus had come to do you know that's why they couldn't really receive him because you know they had their own pre preconceived notions on you know how jesus was supposed to to be to fit into their paradigm you know that's like saying you know god you do what i told you you know that's stupid I mean, excuse me, but um, <laughs> that's not something you would want to do, you know. You, you want to do what God tells you to do or what God says. You know, you don't tell God, you know. You Amen. can ask, you know, you can ask God certain things, but you can you don't tell God anything. You know, that'd be God. <laughs> can I uh, weigh in here on this or do you, do you want to close it out? No, please jump in. So, um, yeah, I have a little bit of a different take 
on this. Uh, I completely understand what everyone is saying about it. Um, uh, if you look at the context of the passage, um, it, it starts with people asking Jesus about his disciples. Right. Um, and then, so the context of that is like, he's, he's talking about his disciples. Um, so when he says no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, uh, there is an element of where he's, he is talking about like his teachings being added to, uh, you know, let's say someone who basically thinks they know everything already, right? Uh, he's sort of talking to, um, he's talking about his disciples as the new wineskins. Like they are, they're unfilled in, in a way. Um, whereas like in Luke, you know, there's something added where it says no one after drinking old wine wishes for new for he says the old is good enough so you can so it's like the old wineskins are already full of old wine they don't they don't they don't want anything new and it's tempting to it's tempting to say that jesus is sort of coming to just sort of like do away with everything um but you have to remember that he was a jew and he all he also said that he didn't come to do that right. um and I understand when, like, when, when people say that, like, the, the law is, like, fulfilled and there is a place, like, there is definitely, that's definitely true. Uh, but if the law was just completely gone and there was no place for it, it would be quoted so much in the New Testament. There's lots of application uh, that the New Testament authors use with, a, with the, with the uh, old law in a different way. Uh, followed like by the letter by just like the outward keeping of it mm -hmm. but it's apt it's applied in like uh, a new a new way it's like in its in its i guess in its fulfilled form you could say that's how it's applied and so i think jesus is talking more about his disciples and kind of referring to them as the the wineskins and saying that you know they're able to sort of absorb. He's basically saying like those who are able to absorb what he's saying, those who are able to hear what he's saying and, and, and uh, accept it. That's kind of how I understand that. Yeah. I think of uh, what Jesus said about the uh, Pharisees when he said, you know, I've come as a physician, you know, he's the physician there and he, he came not for uh, those that feel they're well, but rather for those that are sick, right? Because why did they feel they were well, they had the law, they were following it. And again, I appreciate what you said there, Matt, because I also think of times when Jesus said, uh, you know, listen to what the, the Pharisees say and do, do what they say to do, but make sure your righteousness or hope for a righteousness that exceeds theirs. So I do believe there's an importance in keeping the law intact. And, you know, even uh, I don't know if any of you follow my sermons, but more recently I've been preaching through first Corinthians. And when we get into Corinth, that's where you see a lot of those issues still in the new covenant time in the church, where uh, there were legalists that, you know, were not being ostracized and being called legalists in that sense. Um, there were uh, even some antinomians. They weren't called any of these phrases, of course, uh, but there were some that had different views of the law of Moses right there in the early church. Um, so I do appreciate what you're saying, Matt, because I see that as well. I do see that yeah. he's not giving a license for the forsaking of the law of Moses, especially yeah. uh, see prior to AD 70. Well, do you see and I could also? be wrong. I could be wrong, like with my interpretation of that. It's it's just uh, it's I something that, right. that sticks out in my in when I'm reading the Gospels. Something that always sticks out to me is Jesus is a Jewish man, mm -hmm. and if he in any way like kind of threw away like the law at all it would have disqualified him as the messiah yeah. um even even in the even in the times where you could say well he broke the sabbath well well actually he didn't break the sabbath he 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 showed them that he wasn't actually breaking the sabbath he was doing what was lawful therefore it's not a violation of of the of that commandment um like it's lawful to heal like he was saying it's not unlawful so i'm not so it's not actually he wasn't actually breaking it anyways the the point is like 
that's just kind of what goes through my mind that like, you know, he was a Jewish man. He, he, he kept the laws and, um, you know, I think that when he came, when he said he came to bring the fulfillment of the law, I, I think, you know, I've often thought like, oh, it's just, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. And it's kind of gone. Um, and I think it's just important to sort of see it more from a, that Jewish perspective, uh, because again, it's, it's used so often in our, in our New Testament books, uh, you know. So do you think I'm on the right track, Matt, by saying that um, the law is definitely important and to be kept in a sense, but yet, uh, when if you're under the law, you have to keep every law, you know, and you un you're under that heavy yoke. Through Jesus Christ, you know, you keep the law, but yet you're free. You're free from, you know, I that. Would say, I would say Romans 8 describes it the best um yeah where he's where paul says that you know there's no condemnation for those who are in christ and okay. that what the law couldn't do because it was weak in the flesh god did by sending his own son and then he says so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who mm -hmm. don't walk according to the flesh or according to like the the letter or like the oldness of the of the law but we walk by the spirit and the newness of life i mean even paul says that the law is good if it's used lawfully because it's it's supposed to be used for for mm -hmm. lawlessness um but then it's also constantly applied everywhere in the new testament to like you know like when he brings up like you shall not muzzle the ox you know like he's not saying like he even says like is god concerned about oxen is that what we should be like doing again like should we be muzzling our oxen like is that is that what the law is telling us he's going well no it's like it's pointing to something deeper something you know something um there's a there's a deeper meaning to all of those that's kind of how i understand how does the scripture talk about and, all things are, are are lawful but not all things are edifying or something like that the scripture says yeah there's a different one but yeah yeah but it's referring to the law it's referring to the law well, I want to make sure I get us back on track here. Um, while I appreciate some of these conversations, this is obviously uh, exhaustive and will take us in a, quite a few places. So um, I, I do appreciate uh, the thoughts there. And of course, this does give us all opportunity to mark out some things. However, we are in Isaiah chapter 60 through 61. And I'll tell you, uh, if you would have said anything about the law of Moses being removed or taken away or fulfilled in any sense of what we celebrate today, they would have had no idea what you were talking about, you would have been stoned to death. So uh, that being said, um, it was still a mystery at that point, wasn't it? That's right. So I want to make sure I keep us uh, in on track there with our, our mindset, of course, always encouraging some hindsight bias or apostolic interpretation. But I want to make sure we don't keep going down that road. Uh, I do appreciate that. And even, you know, dare I say, even the allusion to what is going on in that discussion that Vicky brought up is probably taking us outside the purview of where we're at in our current study. So while I appreciate that, Vicki, uh, I hope you, you received uh, ample uh, information in regards to that question. And obviously, we leaned in a bit on uh, some understanding of the law of Moses. So I thank you all for participating in that dialogue. Um, anybody want to jump in with some uh, concluding thoughts here regarding our, our texts? Let, if I might, let me say something with what was just said and take it to a different level, if I might. I okay. think it'll break, break us back to where we're coming. Okay, let's hear what you got. Jesus, Jesus told them, accept your righteousness, exceed that of the Pharisees. Okay? I've preached it this way. Paul said clearly that he was a Pharisee. Concerning law, he was a Pharisee. So a lot of times I've preached that to the manner was except that my righteousness or our righteousness exceed that of Paul. And we'll all say, well, I can't do that. So we say, well, now he was one of the better ones, you know. But if my righteousness couldn't exceed him, my only hope is the resurrection in Christ that my righteousness would exceed that of him because in Christ is the only way that we'll ever do that. Amen. 
through the finished works and being crucified, buried, and raised again. And we died with him, and we rose with him. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that take us back to the resurrection there? No, that's well, amen. It sure does. Obviously, the uh, the author and finisher of the resurrection, uh, the resurrection himself, uh, Jesus. So, amen. I, I appreciate that. Alex. Said ago, I am, I ain't gonna be, I not might be, I could be, I hope to be, but he said, I am the resurrection. That's right. Yes. Well, I want to give opportunity to each of you to uh, share some thoughts. I know I have a way I want to wrap this up uh, and urge us towards 62. Uh, however, uh, any of you have any thoughts you want to share in closing tonight? I'll share one brief, real, real brief, just remark that um, isn't really a deep study at all. But just you said, or you said early on how, like, I, I forget exactly how you said it, but something along the lines of if we would just read the text, we probably wouldn't need as many commentaries and. <laughs> Some, something like that, like, you know, the text is really clear if you just read it. And um, I just remember for years and years as a futurist, um, 40 years, reading through Isaiah in particular and just being completely baffled. And I just see now how it's just because I had those preconceptions of what I, of the teaching that was in my mind that I was trying to form the text to that instead of conforming my mind to the text. But, you know, for, for, you know, now reading through Isaiah, it's just, it's just amazing to me. And I'm so thankful that it's like, I'm not saying that I understand everything perfectly by any means, but it just seems so much clearer sure. um, what's, what's being in there. And it's like, I just agree with what you said, that if we just read the text for the text, um, it would just be so much, it, it's a great commentary. I mean, it's, it, like you said, this is the gospel right here in Isaiah. Amen. You, you know, I think of when you shared that uh, years ago, I read the book by Bill Weiss. It was uh, 98 minutes in hell. And I'll tell you, he took all these verses out of Isaiah and all the prophets, and he created this crazy picture of hell. Now, I totally disagree with that view of hell. Uh, however, I, I read the book and I remember being so perplexed on the way that the prophets would be put together and what they were talking about. And, you know, and really what it showed was it's one of two things and maybe both uh, preconceived notions without a doubt. However, we also have to agree that there was or well, I at least see it in my understanding that a lot of that was that I, I failed to have the proper outline. You know, if you're so you might say preconceived notions, sure, but also because I was looking at the wrong picture. So, you know, incorrectly and, and I actually I didn't have a framework to even work with. That's what I think a lot of people to speak to what I see as a contemporary problem. I think people have been told the Bible's about so many different things and it's just too big a book that you'll never get to get through it, that we lose hope. And when we fail to realize the simplicity of what these details are actually pointing to. And, uh, you, you know, so I definitely appreciate what you said, Simon, and I agree. I think if we just, you know, I have testimony I can shed on just today alone, going through this with my younger brother and him, him getting it, you know, he sees it's a covenant picture. I said, you know, does any of this conjure up ideas about what happens when you go to heaven? And, you know, my brother, he's obviously privy to some of the conversations I have with folks and he sees it. It's very clear when you take the time and read through. Now, again, uh, let's be cautious there. We're not saying we have knowledge of everything or that there's not ample opportunity to keep studying. Um, even as I mentioned tonight, reading through this, I read through it three times and I'm still like, man, there's so much that needs to be said. So, uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate that, Simon, and see the same thing. Amen. As long as we do our job as far as reflect, reflect Christ in our lives, you know, just uh, do the work that Christ would have, a, have the church do with the healing of the nations, you know, uh, through truth, hopefully the nations will come to us and, 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 and you know, they, they would like to, you know, be drawn to us you know, our light, you know, that, that they may see God or be drawn to God, you know. Yeah, if I might put a cap on that, I would say they are. That's why you and I are here in 2022 talking about this. Amen. We are the nations, uh, you know, so amen, amen. Amen. Well, I thank you all. And uh, what I wanted to say in closing, 
would be, of course, a sincere thank you. Um, however, I want to appreciate what Matt said there. Uh, I really see a repetition, and I want to challenge you in this tonight. A couple things in closing. I see a repetition of what we read in 50, let's say Isaiah 58 and 59, and then what we're reading in 60 and 61. It literally flipped. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, just a lot of the same language. I'm even reading back on a point that, uh, that um, excuse me, Matt had made uh, in regards to uh, that verse where it talks about, uh, you know, the, the end of the covenant, as we would often note it, uh, where there will be no more death and mourning for the old things have passed away. And taking a look at the text that we were uh, talking about there, where, uh, let me just get my bearing here. Um, in verse 20 of chapter 60, it says, your sun will set no more, neither will your moon wane. For you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be finished. And again, I believe a good understanding of Revelation 21 through 22 probably removes most of the frustration folks would have with that. Uh, however, another text that came to mind was what we read in Isaiah 58. And in Isaiah 58, very similar language here. Uh, if you notice, if they would begin to walk in the fast that the Lord proclaims, that's what he... He's urging them in Isaiah 58. Notice what it says, starting at verse 10. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness. So we see that same imagery we just read in 60 verse 12. Your light will rise in darkness. Your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a well-watered garden. And like the springs of water whose waters do not fail. And we talked about that in John chapters four and seven. We saw that language. And those among you who will rebuild, who will, will, excuse me, who will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age old foundations. This is exactly what we just read in Isaiah 60 through 61. Same language, same terminology. Uh, you know, now notice this part. And you will be called the repairer of the breach. What was the breach? That's the point. The, the, the breach is the problem. It's what the hope is, is going to fulfill. And the breach was sin. And I'll prove that here in a moment. A repairer of the breach, a restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Now, again, just like Isaiah 60 through 61, much of that language should be bringing you to Revelation 21 through 22. However, I just want to conclude with this point here. Well, furthermore, as we noted tonight, the end that they were waiting for the end of that covenant, that was uh, going to be a removal of the shame and a bring into glory. I'd encourage you to just simply read Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 through 14, and you'll read about the removal of the shame, the honor that they would be provided, notably the heritage of the people of God, uh, that they would become a people where righteousness can flow from them, that they can bless the nations around them and the nations would come to them. What was the problem? We know. Isaiah 59 told us this. We not only saw it as I reiterated at the beginning of our session tonight. Notice right there in verse 2. Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. My friends, that was the death of the old covenant. That was the death that the law magnified. The more they tried to walk worthy of the law by their own self-righteousness, the more it revealed sin. And by the time of Jesus, he's rebuking them and fulfilling these prophecies and helping them see the glory of God, helping them have that glory within themselves, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Just want to conclude tonight, encouraging us that this verse 11 of our chapter 61 really gets in on it for us and helps us see the hope and hopefully you find and rejoice in this, or it has, it provides everlasting joy to you, as it was told to be in verse seven to, for, for the people of God. So, or I'll read the whole verse. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden, there's that imagery, the garden imagery we just saw in 58 and 59. And as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations.
What we're doing tonight and rejoicing in these fulfilled truths is exactly that. His righteousness has and his praise has sprung up among the nations. So uh, I thank you for being a part of that reality tonight. Uh, those of you that are here in this study, I encourage us again towards studying 62 through 64. Dare I say, study this week, Isaiah chapter 60 through 64. Uh, you'll be blessed. Look forward to uh, some notes from me, of course, at mianogonewild.wordpress.com. I'll provide my notes. I'll provide possibly a chart. I'll challenge each of you to maybe come up with a chart of your own. Uh, send it to me if you'd like it to be shared. And uh, I trust that we'll be blessed as we continue to look at uh, the rest of what Isaiah puts in front of us. Thank you all for being here this evening. Edward, I see you're still unmuted. Do you mind praying us out? Sure. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for go coming, going before us, giving us clarity of mind and proper thought and giving us focus, at least for the most part of the program. Uh, I pray that the listeners, uh, and as well as uh, us uh, here today, will glean from what was said and what was taught, you know, through Isaiah, uh, actually 58 through 62, and uh, that, it, that we will be blessed and share and, and just, you know, ruminate what we've uh, learned that we may be able to share with, with the next program and that it will provoke us to conversation and fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again. God bless and go in peace. Good night.